there's not a lot of cutting that has to has to be done with that steak um, other than just take it out of your grind pile and put it into the cuts bin to be vacuum packaged and sent out the door. It's as easy as that. Hello, meat folks. Welcome back to the Meats Pad podcast. This is your humble host, Phil Bass. Here in the wintry north, yes, it is still a little wintry, uh, even though um, we are technically in, in spring. Apparently, Mother Nature did not get that memo, um, but I think it's coming very, very soon. Hopefully, we'll start to get a little bit of a grass is sprouting up here. Good for the cattle, good for the grazing, good for everyone, the moisture that we have been getting. So uh, much appreciated that way, Mother Nature. Um, we have with us a guest who uh, I have gotten to know pretty well over the years, um, and uh, I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, elude to too much because I'm going to have her share her experience with things. But um, we have with us Sierra Jepson. Sierra, how are you doing th this afternoon? I'm so well. I'm so well. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Good. Well, so so um, I'll I'll break the news to the group. Um, Sierra Jepson just recently finished her master's degree in meat science here at the University of Idaho um, with our team. Um, I'm great. I, I was grateful to have her here. Um, the time did not go long enough because um, Sierra is such a driven individual um, that she completed a little earlier than than usual, which is awesome, which is really cool. Puts her back out and into the workforce. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll also say Sierra has um, is, is quite the fabricator. And I think um, beef, beef in particular, um, but other species as well. Um, but some of her research, which is what I want to share with the group today, predominantly, um, had to do with beef fabrication. So, so Sierra, can you talk a little bit about that top sirloin project that you worked on and, um, and, and what it means to the meat community? Absolutely. So the top sirloin is a subprimal of the loin primal. Um, and it, because it's from the loin, there hasn't been a lot of meat fabrication research or muscle profiling on it because the sirloin sells fairly well. It's got its place in mid-range um, restaurant industries. Um, top sirloin steaks are fairly popular. They sell decently at the grocery store. And so there just wasn't a lot of research that you know needed to be conducted was kind of the consensus because, hey, Hey, it sells, so just leave it alone. But um, what was kind of uh, kind of realized with you know the top sirloin butt is comprised of four different muscles, and the gluteus medius being the main muscle. Yes, that muscle sells really well. The culotte. Um, the top sirloin cap, um, the scientific name being the biceps femoris, it sells fairly well, or it's starting to, um, it's starting to gain some traction. So there's two bigger muscles are doing great. Um, but then there are two other muscles that kind of sit on top and they're being incorporated into ground, uh, ground beef trim, which is fine. Ground sirloin's popular. We need ground beef, but it, what if we are missing out on a cut of beef that could actually be another steakable item, another grillable item? And we know that our consumers are always looking for something that can be put on the grill. So even though the sirloin sells well, what if we're, we're missing out? So let's go ahead and instead of just cutting sirloins into big slabs of meat and incorporating all four muscles into one steak, let's separate them out. Let's take a look at how muscle size might change based on the size of the carcass that it's coming from. And then let's dive deeper and look at some of the muscle physiology and look at uh, water holding capacity or the color or even the tenderness of those muscles and see if we can do a comparison. So, yeah, so, so, and this is very important, I would say, not just for the big processors, but especially for the littler processors out there who um, might be looking for those little bits of added margin and you have maybe that that more eclectic and dynamic clientele where you don't necessarily have to have everything all the time, but this is something that you might be able to accumulate over time with some great added value beyond just making ground beef, which again, we have some, some, some tremendous pull through demand for ground beef in uh, the industry right now. Um, but there's always, there's always that question of, can we make more grillable items? And the reality is, I mean, in, in, over the past several years, um, the uh, bovine myology research that was conducted with University of Nebraska and University of Florida in the early, early 2000s um, 
did did a fantastic job at profiling these muscles, but there was still a little little bit more that we could do. And so that was something that Sierra was looking at. And so first off, Sierra, let's let's dive just a little bit deeper into this and, and talk about those particular cuts um, that we can peel and pull and, and, and piece apart from the top sirloin um, and, and just kind of remind everyone just how important it is to do that because um, you'd be surprised just how many folks are still kind of just slabbing whole top sirloins just, just because it's quick, it's high yield, but there's value to be made. Oh, and it's so easy just to, to take a big piece of meat and cut steaks out of it. Absolutely. And even so the gluteus medius being the primary center section of that top sirloin there, even within just that one muscle, there is a dorsal subunit and a ventral subunit. And for anybody who may have ever cut a sirloin, you don't want to just cut those that gluteus medius right down the middle. You actually want to find the seam between the ventral and the dorsal section. It is a big piece of connective tissue. And you want to find that seam and actually follow it. And that's how you then create a baseball sirloin versus just a top sirloin cut, is making sure that that seam of connective tissue doesn't end up right in the middle of your top sirloin steak. Um, and so that's that's kind of one of the, the first problems that you find is, you know, if you go to an Applebee's or a Texas Roadhouse and you order a, a top sirloin steak, the person sitting next to you might have a really tender eating experience. And then you yourself had a tough one. And you're like, I don't know, we ordered the same cut. Well, if if that ventral and dorsal subunit were not cut along that seam of connective tissue, somebody might have gotten some chewy stuff in their steak. Um, and so just at the top sirloin section of, of that cut, um, there, there is some variability. And then with my research, we wanted to see within the ventral and the dorsal subunit, the bigger and the smaller portion, was there any tenderness variability there? Um, was there any differences in the color or the water holding capacity? And we actually, we found that there was. The dorsal subunit being where the baseball sirloin traditionally would come from, was actually the lesser tender piece of meat, um, was actually a little bit paler in color, um, not quite that that dark cherry red that, that folks were expecting. And so that was that was unexpected for us to find that the bigger piece of the sirloin was actually a smidge more tender um, and could hold a little bit more water. So like we as meat scientists were surprised in just the, the top sirloin cut it's, itself. So um, I don't know if, if you could hear it, Sierra, but the gasps amongst our listening audience right now um, were audible, even though this was a recording. Um, yes, you know, it's, it's really crazy to see uh, for so long I've, I've, I've had an anecdotally been told that the baseball top sirloin, um, that one particular smaller section subunit of the top sirloin center muscle um, is going to by far going to be the, the, more, the more tender. Um, well, Turns out Sierra was actually to, uh, able to discover empirically, meaning we have actual data uh, that says otherwise. And now it doesn't mean that it's drastically different in tenderness and that you should just grind all those and go away from it all. No, it just means that now we just have a better understanding of the top sirloin. And maybe if you I isolate specific pieces and parts, as we've done with so many other cuts throughout the carcass, um, you, you might be able to add value overall to those pieces and parts. And, and another great example is, is the top sirloin cap. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, as Dr. Bass mentioned, there's you know this empirical data and st statistically looking at the USDA thresholds of tenderness, uh, the gluteus medius muscle itself was statistically less tender than the biceps femoris, which is that sirloin cap, and then the gluteus accessoris that will We'll talk about a little bit later. So it was less tender than those two muscles. The biceps femoris being the sirloin cap or the culotte, um, which is gaining a lot of a lot of traction in today's meat market. Um, it did have um, the the darkest, most red beef color, um, which was which was excellent to find. And then it was statistically one of the the lower, I guess, lower on the tenderness. Um, the Warner Brats are sheer for scale. So being a more tender muscle than the traditional gluteus medius muscle that is being served traditionally to our consumers. Um, so we're excited that the muscle that is taking off, um, whether that's in the grocery store or in restaurants, and people are getting excited about it on their plates, um, they actually can, can get excited about it from a scientific standpoint as well. 
So you just you just mentioned one more muscle, and that's the gluteus accessorius. And so for those who are out there um, wondering if this is indeed a dinosaur from the Cretaceous period, it is not. Um, this is actually uh, this is a, a a muscle that has been there the whole time on the on the beef carcass. Um, uh, and it was time to investigate a little bit further. And so Sierra, tell us a little bit about that unique creature. Yes, so the gluteus accessorius butts right up against the gluteus profundus. And those two muscles sit on top of the entire center section and are so easy to peel off and incorporate into your grind. The profundus being the muscle that actually holds the hip bone to the rest of the top sirloin butt. So yes, it has a lot of connective tissue. It does a very difficult job of holding this entire you know, subprimal to a bone. So there's a lot of connective tissue there. That muscle should continue to be ground. However, the gluteus accessorius really marries right up against that muscle. Um, it's it's fairly long. Um, I forget the exact measurement, but it's it's about uh, six inches in length or so. Um, and it's a, approximately one inch in height, which is stake thickness. So we didn't have to go through and cut the gluteus accessorius into a stake thickness before having a grillable item in our hands, which is exciting for small meat packers who are looking for more items to give to you know customers. There's not a lot of cutting that has to has to be done with that steak, um, other than just take it out of your grind pile and put it into the cuts bin to be vacuum packaged <laughs> and sent out the door. It's as easy as that. Um, and so what we found with this muscle is when you separate it out, it's it's you know about the right length, about the right thickness, and when you grill it. It has um, the similar tenderness to that biceps femoris, that sirloin cap, the culotte. They're all in the same tenderness scale. Um, it has really excellent water holding capacity. And so that means that that steak is going to be really juicy. There is previous research that shows that consumers love to overcook sirloins. I'm sure it's because this muscle doesn't, or, or the, the subprimal doesn't marble it as well as say the ribeye or something, you know, closer to the, the chuck or the anterior portion of the animal. So there's not a lot of marbling to serve as that insurance policy. And so if our consumers are overcooking sirloins, maybe by accident, maybe because they, you know, like a higher degree of doneness, the gluteus accessorius muscle is going to retain more water and going to have a more tender, juicy eating experience, which is fantastic. Um, and we we found that it's, it's going to be tender, it's going to be juicy. Um, the color on it is, is fairly dark and um, th that reddish color that consumers are expecting as well. Not quite as light in color as the other gluteus medius portions of the, of the top sirloin. And so why are we grinding this muscle? And it, I, I simply think it comes down to um, the lack of that muscle profiling research. It's an easy muscle to grind. So um, you know, folks just didn't know it was, it was underneath some of that connective tissue. For so long, you know, uh, I would say the, a good majority of the meat cutters out there who have steamed out the top sirloin, they've called it the mouse muscle. And and in reality, it's it's the mouse, as in it has two muscles in it. And why we call it the mouse is beyond me, because I don't know of anybody who really wants to eat mouse meat, but, but um, it, it's two muscles. And so it does take a, a little bit of additional fabrication. But with minimal fabrication and considering the price of beef that we're going to be walking into in the next three years. And uh, uh, I, I don't want to put any alarm bells out there, but um, get ready guys. Cause we're, we're starting to, to ha have a, a, we're going to have a pretty small herd here um, going into the next couple of years. And so that means we need to get every little scrap of meat off of this animal as possible. Another thing to think about too, is that um, any, any larger processors out there who maybe service a resort, or, or a cruise line or something like that who are looking for easy to use, easy to grill. It's a steak that's ready to go portioned off of the animal. Like nature took care of it for you. All you gotta do is is, is cut the darn thing um, and package it. This would be a great um, kind of specialty item. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit smaller, I would say, Sierra, two thirds the size of a Terrace Major maybe, which is, which is a very popular cut, shoulder, petite mm -hmm. shoulder tender for the rest of the folks out there. And, you know, we don't want to sit down and compare it against the Terrace Major because we didn't conduct that research. We'd love if somebody else wants to conduct that research. Excellent point. Excellent. Yep. <laughs> but 
it, you know, some of the questions I did get while I was conducting my research is, well, you know, you're only going to get one of these states. It's, it's, it's portion size. So one person's going to eat that, that cut off of one side of the carcass. So you really, you only get two per animal. Is that really worth it? Well, if you think of the Terrace Major, that's, that's a cut that's now being served in the restaurant industry and is being sliced up and served on salads. Um, and there are only, you know, one per side, two per carcass. And it has, um, it started to become a substitute for tender wine that the Terrace Major has. And so the Terrace Major only getting one per side is becoming more difficult to grasp onto. So maybe some of those restaurant folks who are using the Terrace Major, they might soon need an alternative for Terrace Major. And yeah. so enter the gluteus accessorius, which, um, which we so fondly would like to call the sirloin tender, um, which is uh, an easy way for a consumer to remember. And they like to gravitate towards any steak that is called tender when they actually are. I love it. You heard it here, folks. Um, it is now, it has now been named. It is an item that uh, I think we all need to be Thinking more about, um, I, again, I, I can't stress enough that we need to get the most that we can out of these beef carcasses from a profitability standpoint at the at the uh, uh, meat processors level, but also a profitability standpoint from the producer level um, to make sure that we are we're we're sharing in some of those uh, ad advantages um, uh, at at the meat level. Okay. All right. So, so you've mentioned an awful lot. I've been continuing to take notes here um, for, I, I want to change gears just a little bit because I, I love the top sirloin project. And I think you shared a lot of great things on that. Um, but I want to talk more about you and, and what's going on in uh, Sierra's life th uh, these days. Um, and uh, if you haven't noticed already, Sierra is, is very bright, very driven, very dynamic and energetic, um, which was why she fits so well with our team, uh, uh, our research team. Um, but uh, Sierra has begun a, a uh, meat consultation business out there called Butcher Solutions. What a great name, by the way. So, Sierra, can you tell everyone about this? And uh, maybe let's drum up some business for you. Absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. So so this idea was um, for Butcher Solutions, which is a traveling meat cutting school, a traveling school for butchers. I will um, go to small meat processors and help them train employees so that we can have a more consistent labor force, a more well-trained labor force that, um, you know, is, is prepared to work in this industry and is going to stick around for the long haul. Um, I, I drummed up this idea when I was a meat judging coach at the University of Wyoming, and it actually became the reason I wanted to go to grad school, was as I was working with meat judging students and talking with meat processors, the number one thing that they were telling me was how difficult it was to find and retain skilled labor. And so as I was cutting, you know, just subprimals or primals for my meat judgers, thinking that, wow, if, if I myself could become a better butcher and could know all the scientific names and, and I could teach folks in the industry about butchery techniques, wouldn't that be great? Then we could have more folks understanding the science behind, uh, behind meat products and be able to have more consistent meat products being turned out um, and keep some of these small meat processors in business um, and keep their customers happy too. And, and then the livestock producers that they serve as a result. And so I wanted to go to the University of Idaho because of the reputation of being able to, to cut meat with Dr. Phil Bass and learn all these cool scientific names and where everything came from um, so that then myself could be a better butcher and I could teach others. And so I... Uh, I guess during my my time at the University of Idaho was really looking forward to getting back into the industry as quickly as I could, so I could start Butcher Solutions. And so um, I think a week after I had graduated in December, um, the business was established. And so I'm actually I'm currently recording this podcast from a a meat processor in Montana, where we are training six individuals um, at this meat processor. They they had had an injury with their their primary meat cutter he you know a tendon just quit one day in his arm and he was the only employee of this of this facility and so it just so happened that a lumber mill had also burned down in, in town and there were folks looking for employment and so their their meat lab manager said well I guess if they can run a bandsaw you know to cut wood they could probably run a, run a bandsaw to cut meat and so he hired me to come in and train their employees uh, you know this group of five folks, anywhere from, you know, uh, working at a lumber mill. One gal came from New Zealand. She was building boats in New Zealand and liked to tan hides, but, you know, had never 
you know, worked in meat, the meat industry before. And so um, now these six individuals are working at this meat processing plant. And um, we've been working on the harvest and fabrication of beef for this is the third week now. And the whole goal is that these will then be the folks who work in this facility full time. And they, they want to know everything from, you know, why are some muscles more red than others? Why are grocery store cuts of beef super bright red and the ones that we turn out a little bit more purple? Um, where, where, you know, I worked at this meat processing plant and we called this the Delmonico steak, but, but it looks a lot like a ribeye. Why is that? And so there's, there's yes, so is. many, yeah. <laughs> exactly. oh, so there's, there's so much that even folks who work in the meat industry have questions about. And um, one of the gals, she did work at a processor just right up the road. And um, she kept saying, you know, they, they have workshops for, for the folks in, in, in our building who like to grind the meat and to make the recipes and the sausage. And there are workshops for the processing meat of side of things. There aren't workshops that teach you hands-on meat fabrication. There, there isn't a place I can go to learn these different, these different cuts and why a chef might call it one thing and we call it something else. And so she was really excited to learn the scientific names and where all the cuts come from. And so um, the whole point behind Butcher Solutions is that I, I hope that I can cater meat science education to whatever a small meat processor might need mm -hmm. to better you know, train and educate their workers and add value to those people um, so that then they want to stick around and continue working this job for a while because it's not easy work to stand on coal wet concrete every day but if you can add value and make them excited about what they're offering to their customers then I think you're going to just add value to your workforce. Well, and, and such a good compliment to a previous podcast that we just uh, we just published um, with uh, Kevin Trosclair and his uh, operation up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, um, uh, 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 Mountain View Custom Meats. Check them out if you haven't already. Um, but uh, a, a really neat uh, business model where they're they're doing their best to maintain employment. But what happens when when the worst happens? And let's make lemonade out of lemons and that's exactly what it sounds like you're doing right now right now sierra um you know uh, all the stars seem to align and, and the timing was just right um and so it sounds like we're going to be able to uh, really help out a business that otherwise could have gone into some really struggling times um and and sierra's there to help um you know at the at the risk of sierra um uh, taking away all of 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 my time where i get to go out and train train butchers which is it, I'll, I'll be honest it's not as much time as i'd like um uh how how can folks get a hold of you now sierra um and 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 get uh, get you to their plants to help train their team absolutely so the website just went live last week which i'm really excited about so it is Butcher Solutions LLC.com and people can hop on there. Um, all of my contact information, everything that, you know, the meat science education offerings that I am excited to come and meet your team and perform myself um, are all on there. Um, I am located in Livingston, Montana. And again, I am working with a meat processor out here. They are a nonprofit meat processor. So they are more than willing to have folks come in and train. Um, all the products we turned out are ground and put into um, ground beef for um, uh, the food banks here in Montana. And so if you've never processed meat ever before, but you want to, but you're afraid to mess something up, no worries. You can come to Montana and it's all going to get ground anyway, so we can teach you. Um, but if you are a small processor that either is looking to hire a new crew um, or you have a crew and you just want to send them through some meat science training, I the whole point is it's a traveling butcher school and I will come to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, hop on ButcherSolutionsLLC.com. Um, check it out and let me come and work with you. Yeah. So, okay. And, and one more time, that's Butcher Solutions, not Butchers, but Butcher Solutions, LLC.com. Um, make sure you reach out to her. Um, and and uh, um, I, I know that you will learn something. I, I always learn something anytime I get a chance to visit with, with Sierra. Um, one more thing, Sierra, before we wrap things up, uh, something we ask pretty much all of our guests on here at least once is how did you get into the meat business? I was a student at Ohio State University and I, I grew up on a beef cattle farm and my senior year at Ohio State I wanted to take the beef production class and it was full and I couldn't fit it in my schedule I was actually an ag business major too and so I was just I didn't ever want to be a vet so I just wanted to take this beef 
this beef class and it was full. So I was like, well, I guess I'll take meat science. That's kind of the same thing as beef cattle. So um, by the second day of my senior year at Ohio State, I added this class. Um, and by day two, I had joined the meat judging team, I had uh, got a job working the meat lab. I had added, I decided to take a fifth year just so I could only take meat science classes. Um, and from there, I, I knew I wanted to go to grad school, but the opportunity to, to be a meat judging coach first came along and then this idea for a business came along and so and grad school helped me start the business so it just the ball just keeps rolling so um who knows where now butcher solutions will take me um within the meat industry but i'm sure it's just going to keep snowballing from here but the the opportunities are endless as long as you just mm -hmm. keep your door open <laughs> absolutely well and this is just such an, an another great example for those who are out there and might be scratching their head as as to what's the next move um just just look around because those opportunities do abound. Um, they may not be as obvious and sometimes might be a, a, even a little frustrating because it wasn't the, the path that you thought you were going to go down. Um, but uh, look look at what Sierra is doing right now um, and, and um, take those opportunities as they do come and take some of those frustrating times as almost blessings at times uh, to know uh, that that something something else good might be just around the corner and you just didn't know it yet and so um, this is such a great uh, great opportunity um, uh, Sierra thank you so much for joining us today and um, you know what Let, let's keep talking let's keep talking about how we continue to train the workforce because th that is such a huge uh, a huge part of of the challenges that we're we're encountering right now um, one of the biggest questions that I continue to get is how do we get more folks involved and um, if we, if they're, if they're even just less than just 0.5% 5, 5 of the population out there like Sierra, who, um, uh, all you got to do is introduce them to the meat world. Um, we could fix a lot of problems very, very quickly. And it's for, for any size processor, large or small, and I don't care if it's beef fabrication, pork sausage, you name it. Um, sometimes we just need to get folks involved and take that opportunity to share the idea with them. Um, and so uh, this might indeed, uh, Sierra's, Sierra's direction and her business might indeed be a way of introducing a, a, a new population of young folks to a really cool career path. So again, Sierra, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care.